this report on the period 1 October 1960 to 31 December 1960 will cover six areas of achievement in the B-58 weapon system program. These were refused takeoff tests, endurance testing of the flight control system, the escape capsule program, bombing capabilities, the delivery of the first production conversion B-58, and cyclic fatigue tests, part of the structural fatigue certification program. At the Air Force Flight Test Center, Edwards Air Force Base, California, ARDC conducted a series of high-energy refused takeoff tests. These RTO runs were set up to establish brake, tire, and wheel capability during actual performance of the B-58A airplane. At the predetermined refusal speed, the one which would yield the desired braking energy level, all four engines were reduced to idle power and except on two runs, the drag chute was deployed. Aerodynamic braking, that is, rotation of the aircraft to an extreme nose-high attitude to produce high drag, proved very effective in reducing stopping distance. On most runs, brakes were applied only after the nose wheel touched down. As a safety precaution, wheels were equipped with fusible blowout plugs, and shields were installed to protect the wheel wells and wings. The RTOs were conducted with gross weights varying from 160 to 163,000 pounds. After each run, tires and brakes were removed and replaced with new assemblies. High braking temperatures resulted in expected tire bead deterioration. During the actual test runs, however, all tires, wheels and brakes performed satisfactorily and experienced no operational failures. As demonstrated by the aircraft's excellent directional control, the energy distribution between the brakes was very uniform. Blowout plugs were successful in preventing tire blowouts and are being included in production designs. After the completion of 10 intermediate energy RTO runs in October and November, a go-ahead was given for the design limit run at 163,000 pounds gross weight on December the 1st. This would determine the maximum energy stopping capability of the B-58A's deceleration systems. Plans were to generate approximately 18 million foot-pounds of energy per brake. This would check data on predicted performance against actual aircraft performance and supply additional data for inclusion in the B-58 flight handbook. The run was made with the wind at calm. Refusal speed was 160 knots and aerodynamic braking was employed. Brakes were applied at 131 knots, and as on previous RTOs, braking was uniform as shown by the good directional control. Actual brake energy absorbed was 17,100,000 foot-pounds per brake. Based on the preceding RTO's data, the predicted total distance, including acceleration, was 13,500 feet. The actual stop was within 60 feet of this, 13,440 feet. The successful completion of these RTOs represents an achievement in determining by actual test the performance of the B-58. Data on the design speed run, when added to that of the other runs in the series, led to the following conclusions. On all runs, braking was more effective than had been calculated. The drag chute proved to be slightly less effective than predicted but the combination of brakes plus chute was more effective. Using both, average distance needed to accelerate and stop was at least 20% less than predicted. The tests showed that in many instances, use of aerodynamic braking prior to wheel braking results in the same stopping distance as brakes used with the chute, and this was considered an excellent safety feature. The RTO tests proved out the production B-58's deceleration systems and marked another success for the tires, wheels, and brakes program. Convair's Engineering Test Laboratory, 
scene of an extensive endurance program conducted during the period on the B-58 flight control system. Actually, three production airplane systems were utilized. One was fitted to this full-scale installation. Another was set up on a simplified test stand to accumulate as much data as possible in the shortest calendar time. And the third was put in an environmental facility for evaluating the effects of vibrations on systems components under flight temperature conditions. Each of the three was scheduled for 2,000 hours of operation in order to obtain reliability parts failure data on the improved flight control configuration and determine if further hardware improvements would be required. In operational cycling, the many electronic, hydraulic, and mechanical components were subjected to the same conditions encountered in actual flight. This Scoresby oscillating table, for example, supplied the inputs necessary to simulate the in-flight signals of the rate gyro and accelerometer package, a chief sensing element. Though not strictly part of the flight control system, the air data computer was also evaluated since certain of its signals constitute essential inputs to the system. Simulated flights were set up to cover the entire Mach, altitude, gross weight, and configuration profiles encountered in a typical tactical mission. The various stages of each flight were monitored on a display panel. A green light provided indication of a flight's progression from takeoff to landing. As a check on system performance, all inputs and outputs were recorded at specified points during each test cycle. The results were then compared with pre-recorded baseline data. A deviation of the two traces would indicate a discrepancy in component operation. In addition to gathering information about system performance as a function of operating time, this check procedure would also allow verification and revision, if necessary, of component replacement schedules by furnishing performance data over a long operating time. By the end of the reporting period, the systems had been operated 2,358 equivalent flight hours with only 17 malfunctions during simulated flight. None of these were items affecting safety of flight. It is expected that the completion of the program in early spring will provide valuable data on reliability failure rates and maintenance of the system. Activity in the escape capsule program was primarily in wind tunnel and sled testing. Several series of tests were run at the Arnold Engineering Development Center to gauge performance aspects of the stabilization chute, operating in conjunction with the basic capsule at speeds up to Mach 1.6. The 16-foot transonic wind tunnel was used. One such series had as its objective the determination of an optimum chute configuration the chief criteria being type, size, and porosity. Two chutes showed considerable promise. One, a 30-degree conical design with 20% porosity, and the other, a hemisflow with 21% porosity. Both were found to function exceptionally well. The hemisflow chute remained fully inflated and was very stable. A final selection will be made after completion of wind tunnel tests at higher Mach numbers. Another test series was for the purpose of exploring the pitch and yaw characteristics of the capsule when equipped with inverted yaw and body fins. It was found that the body fins caused instability in the chute during capsule yaw. This was, of course, only one of several capsule configurations tested. Comparisons were also made in performances with and without cold air jet simulation. Notice the blue plume of the high-pressure air used to simulate rocket effects. Another goal was to measure back plate and bottom plate pressure distribution on the capsule. Findings were to be correlated with the results from sled test ejections. At Hurricane Mesa, three sled test runs involving both crew and pilot capsules were made in the course of the period. The first run of November 8th was programmed for a speed of 444 knots. For this and the two subsequent runs, a fiberglass extension was added to the sled fuselage to reduce turbulence, which had caused the stabilization chute to dip behind the sled on an earlier run.
After ejection, the capsule showed good trajectory, although experiencing a slight pitch up. The stabilization systems function properly. The pilot capsule, although starting off on a low trajectory, cleared the mesa and had a stable descent. In its descent, the crew capsule impacted on the slope of the escarpment. The capsule showed only slight damage, even the crew capsule which had struck the side of the mesa. In fact, both were repaired for reuse. The second run was made on December 12th with a 606 knot speed schedule. Because its mortar trip mechanism malfunctioned, the stabilization chute of the pilot capsule did not deploy and the capsule had a very low trajectory. The crew capsule had an easy, stable descent to the bottom of the mesa with both stabilization and recovery systems functioning perfectly. It was later retrieved in excellent condition. The third run, programmed for low speed, was made a few days later on December 15th. The capsules of the first run were again used. The crew capsule performed according to test specifications, its trajectory being good and all systems functioning correctly. The pilot capsule, however, malfunctioned. Indications were that the unsymmetrical location of the rocket in the pilot capsule was causing instability. Accordingly, a corrective program was jointly formulated by Convair and Stanley, the chief measure plan being a realignment of the capsule's thrust axis. The test fixture was sent to Stanley and Denver for accomplishment of this task. This series of runs materially advanced knowledge of the capabilities of the escape capsule and pointed up areas of needed improvement. During the period, the bombing capability of the B-58 was further refined by a series of bomb pod drops, both MB and TCP, at various altitudes. On November 22nd, an MB pod drop was made over the Holloman Range. Its primary purpose was to release the pod using the bombing navigation system. A supplementary aim was to evaluate the system's automatic computers, the simulated warhead environment and operation, and the pod arming and fusing system. Altitude over the target was 50,000 feet, speed exactly Mach 2. The pod was released for the bombing navigation system according to plan. Its impact was within specification tolerances. 98% of the telemeter data was obtained on arming and fusing, vibration and environmental factors in addition to other essential data. This was the last MB pod drop scheduled to be made by Convair. Two low altitude drops of the bomb component of the two component pod were made over Tonopah by a Convair test aircraft. Bomb separation from the aircraft was good on both drops but explosive severance of the pod tail section to initiate chute deployment malfunctioned. Consequently, the retardation system could not operate. With these drops indicating the need for a revamping of the tail section severance system, a number of changes are planned. A backup severance system is to be added and redundant power supplies are to be furnished for the primary and backup units. During the period, Two high-altitude drops of the TCP bomb component over the Holloman test range were very successful. With Convair test aircraft number 38, the carrier, the first drop was made on October 25th. Altitude, 45,000 feet. Speed, Mach 0.92. The bombing navigation system had automatic control of the release, which was cleanly affected. All telemetered data was secured except on two arming and fusing functions. Good ballistic data from range optics also resulted. The second drop, likewise from number 38, was made on 16 December. Altitude of the aircraft was again 45,000 feet, but speed was increased to Mach 1.6.
With the bombing navigation system again in control, separation from the aircraft was good. Survey showed that the bomb impacted 316 feet from target. Ballistics data was uniformly satisfactory and telemetering showed improvement over the earlier drop in that all data was obtained. During the period, continued investigation was also being conducted to determine the cavity pressures between the bomb and the fuel tank. Data were needed to establish the force required to overcome the cavity pressures for initiating separation of the lower component. Thus, the drop program made substantial gains by its collection of valuable data on both major types of weapon delivery and in the case of the Severin system malfunction by providing the informational basis for the appropriate corrective measures. In December, airplane number 28, the first production conversion B-58, was turned over to the Air Force. Through the production conversion program, flight test airplanes are modified into the tactical configuration. In all, 11 of these airplanes will be converted into operational B-58s with full tactical capability. They will be basically identical to the airplanes of the number 47 and on configuration, compatible with the same ground support equipment and 100% supportable with production spares. During this reporting period, TB number no. 2 and 8 tactical airplanes were also delivered into Sachs inventory. At Carswell Air Force Base, operational B-58s of the 43rd Bomb Wing established a new three-month high of 685 flight hours. A routine flight of three hours and 20 minutes on October the 12th included one hour and 48 minutes supersonic. Of this, one hour and 18 minutes was flown Mach 2. After a normal turnaround, the same aircraft flew another mission, an example of the B-58's present operational capability. In the Structural Fatigue Certification Program at Convair, sonic fatigue tests have been successfully completed and cyclic fatigue tests are now well underway. Testing to the equivalent of 10 years of service life is expected to be complete by midsummer. In addition to cycling aircraft number 29 itself, four components were designated for individual cycling. These were a half wing, the nose landing gear and forward pod hook support structures, and the aft fuselage and tail. The program load has been determined by analysis to present loads equivalent to actual expected flight conditions. Cycling goes from zero load to program load to zero load, and by this means, structural fatigue conditions that the aircraft will encounter during its service life are simulated. Testing of two components, the aft fuselage and tail and the forward pod hook, was completed during the period. Load cycling accumulated on these was the equivalent of 7,000 flight hours with the accompanying ground operation conditions. In the overall testing to date, including the aircraft and components, no structural failures have been incurred that would affect safety of flight. The Structural Fatigue Certification Program was set up so that the accumulation of fatigue damage on airplane number 29 is always ahead of the service usage of B-58s now in SACS inventory. If a fatigue failure should occur on Airplane 29, a fix could be made on service aircraft long before the critical area could be expected to become a problem. Considered one of the most complete and realistic cyclic fatigue tests ever conducted on a single sample, they assure that tactical B-58 can be flown with proven structural integrity and reliability throughout their service life.